to a presentation of selected works by members of the Tulane Maritime Law Journal. My name is Jean Ami. I'm currently the editor-in-chief of Volume 40 of the journal, and I'm happy you could all make it here this evening. Tonight you'll hear from seven students um, who will be published in our upcoming issue out this summer 2016. These students will share their insights on several recent maritime cases uh, spanning many jurisdictions. I hope you enjoy them. But before we get started, uh, on behalf of the journal, I would like to thank a few folks. First, the ABA's Admiralty and Maritime Law Committee for sponsoring this event year after year. Further, I'd like to thank Ray Wade and Lisco and Lewis for hosting this event uh, each semester for our students to present their work. Finally, looking around this room, I'd like to thank members of our Board of Advisory Editors, our mentors, alumni, and our faculty advisor, Professor Martin Davis, for your continued support of our students' legal scholarship. Have a great time. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Guy Bogan, and I'm a second year law student at Tulane, pursuing a certificate in Admiralty Law. I first want to thank my mentor, Tootsie Burke, for helping me with my case now. Tonight, I will be speaking about a recent Third Circuit decision titled Maher Terminals, LLC, for a Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which focused on a little known part of the Constitution called the Tonnage Clause. I had initially been researching the Fifth Circuit's most recent decision in the Katrina Breach of Saga, but decided not to follow this one because it was a little more salty. Before I launch into the court's decision, some background is likely necessary. Described as quirky by scholars, the Tonnage Clause, found in Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution, provides that no state without the consent of Congress to lay a duty of tonnage. Although not expressly in the clause, it was meant to apply to taxes on ships. The, dra the drafters cast the tonnage clause in a supporting role for the imports and exports clause, where we had the prohibition on state taxation of imports and exports would be circumvented by taxing the vessels carrying the merchandise. Initially, this clause was treated narrowly, literally banning weight-based taxation on vessels. During the 19th century, the Supreme Court expanded this definition. In the passenger cases, the court extended tonnage scrutiny to, take, to state taxes on passengers, crews, and masters. Importantly, in its holding, the court stated that a state could not indirectly do that which it was forbidden to do directly under the clause. Adding to the passenger cases, the Supreme Court held in Southern Steve Cove, New Orleans versus Post Wardens that even a flat fee on a vessel just for entering port was forbidden under the Tonnage Clause. This, those out there in the maritime business may be scratching their heads at this. In the modern era, states find all sorts of ways to tax vessels. This in inconsistency is explained by two equally broad exceptions to the clause. One exception allows states to tax vessels as any other personal property, as long as it was done so in the same manner. This same manner requirement has also eroded away, expanding the tonnage clause, uh, expanding this exception either, even further. The other exception allowed states to levy tonnage fees that were rationally related to services provided to ships, such as harbor fees or facility maintenance. Thus, during the 19th century, while the Supreme Court was weaving, weaving a wide net for the clause, it was also slashing holes in that net. At some point, the net became so shredded by these exceptions that the tonnage clause became a constitutional relic of a bygone era. An unexpected decision in 2009 unearthed the clause. In Polar Tankers versus Valdez, Alaska, the Supreme Court focused its entire decision on analysis of the clause, highlighting the same manner requirement that had fallen out of use by earlier courts. The court ruled that a tax on oil tankers docking in Valdez was not done so in the same manner as landside personal property and there, therefore was unconstitutional under the clause. 
And with that, let's move back to my note case, which was the first time a circuit court took up analysis of the tonnage clause post polar tankers. Maher Terminals, a large stevedoring operation, leases a container, container terminal from the Port Authority in New York, New Jersey. Under dispute was a container through port rental, a yearly fee levied by the Port Authority based on the amount of containers handled by Maher. Under the traditional tonnage clause net, this volume-based tax might have seemed a little suspicious. Maher's attorney had cleverly latched onto the indirect language from the Supreme Court's early decision in passenger cases, arguing that the container through port rental was an indirect tonnage tax on the ships using its facility. In the noted case, although the Third Circuit addressed several issues, the opinion focused primarily on Maher's tonnage clause claim. The Third Circuit rejected this indirect argument from Maher's attorneys, reasoning that only vessels and vessel owners fell within the clause's zone of interest, and that allowing land-based entities to bring tonnage claims would create an unwieldy maritime commerce clause. Could portside restaurants now fall within the clause? Providing fodder for the curious, the court noted in dicta that a vessel or owner may have a tonnage clause challenge for a sim similar container through port rental. In a strong dissent, Circuit Judge Jordan argued that the indirect language from early tonnage clause cases should be applied to Maher here. He felt that, just as taxes on masters, passengers, and crews have been disallowed, a stevedore could also be added to that list. As the first appellate decision to wade through the tonnage clause, the Third Circuit's decision in the noted case did little to answer the worries of scholars about the reinvigoration of the same man rule brought by, by the Supreme Court and polar tankers. However, the wider implication of the Supreme Court's decision became evident. An imaginative legal team used the lens of polar tankers to force a court to rethink the tonnage clause. The dicta from the Third Circuit's decision paints this, partic this picture particularly well. With around 90% of global trade traveling by sea, the noted case demonstrates that the Supreme Court's reinvigoration of the tonnage clause and polar tankers may be an important step in reassessing whether states are trying to circumvent the Constitution in their ports. At the very least, practitioners should take note of the clause and consider, consider adding it to their arsenal. Thank you. Ashley Gambaluka, and I'm a junior member on the Maritime Law Journal. And tonight I'll be discussing a products liability decision under general maritime law that came out of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal and is titled CHMM LLC versus Freeman Marine Equipment. In the case, the Jamaica Bay was out at sea on her way to the Bahamas when a weather tight door on the foredeck malfunctioned and caused the entire interior of the yacht to be flooded with water, leaving its owner with over $18 million of damage. A few years prior, the owner had contracted with a German shipbuilder for the construction of the yacht. Under the contract, the owner was to construct and install the interior outfit of the yacht on its own and in accordance with the shipbuilder's construction schedule. And then the shipbuilder was responsible for the construction of the bare ship. The shipbuilder then subcontracted with a company called Freeman Marine Equipment to manufacture and install the weather-type door that allegedly later failed and caused all of the extensive damage. The owner brought several products liability claims in tort against Freeman Marine, seeking to recover the loss sustained from the failure of the door. The question was whether the owner was able to bring such tort claims, or was the owner only able to bring claims in contract or warranty theory? Such a question is governed by the economic loss doctrine. The need to protect the public from hazardous materials and products is the driving force behind all products liability law. Because products liability actions of manufacturers influence to create safe and non-defective products to, in order to avoid a lawsuit for vast amounts of damages. However, courts recognize that there still needs to be a place for warranty law so that manufacturers are not overburdened with an unlimited amount of claims against them in tort. 
To address such concerns, the Supreme Court developed the economic loss doctrine in East River Steamship versus Transamerica de la Law. And it presents the circumstances in which warranty law applies and those in which tort law apply. The distinction between which applies rests ultimately rests upon whether the defective product caused damage to the pro property itself or to other property. Courts have used this summary to explain the economic loss doctrine. If a plaintiff is in a contractual relationship with the manufacturer of a product, the plaintiff can sue in contract for the normal panoply of contract damages, including foreseeable lost profits and all other economic losses. Whether or not the plaintiff is in a contractual relationship with the manufacturer, though, the plaintiff can sue the manufacturer in tort only for damages resulting from physical injury to persons or to property other than the product itself. Since the formation of this principle, courts have sought to clarify the limitations of the doctrine and have struggled with defining the term the product itself and the term other property. The Supreme Court has since found that the product that the manufacturer places into the stream of commerce is the product itself, and that items added to the vessel after the user purchases the vessel are considered other property, reasoning that such items cannot foreseeably be warranted by the manufacturer. This general knowledge about the economic loss doctrine and its application brings us back to the case that um, we were talking about. Was the interior of the yacht that was flooded considered the product itself or considered other property? The Ninth Circuit ultimately found that the interior portion qualifies as other property, reversing the district court's decision. After evaluating the contract between the owner and the German shipbuilder, the court recognized three things. First, the shipbuilder was responsible for manufacturing the bear ship. Two, the owner added items to the bear ship. And three, the shipbuilder was not responsible for manufacturing or assembling any of those user added items. Therefore, the interior outfit that the owner installed was classified as other property, while the bear ship itself was the product itself. So since the malfunctioning door was part of the bear ship, the economic loss doctrine does not prevent the owner from bringing a tort action against the manufacturer for any marine equipment. This means, according to the Ninth Circuit, that the term other property even applies to property that an owner adds to a vessel prior to actual delivery of the vessel, as a completed vessel, which is different than prior decisions from courts that focus on what is placed into the stream of commerce. Courts here have reasoned that it does not matter when the items are added because the real issue is who added the items. If items damage were added by the user, they are considered other property, and the user can bring an action in tort. If the items are part of the product itself that the manufacturer is selling, <laughs> then one can only bring a warranty or contract action against the pro for the property damage. Therefore, this case hinges on the fact that the owner constructed the interior outfit rather than the shipbuilder constructing the entire yacht. Although the Ninth Circuit ultimate holding of this case is sound, its expansion and redefinition of the term other property within the economic loss doctrine leads the way for questionable applications to of the rule to future claims. And this is questionable for two reasons. First is that the purpose of the economic loss doctrine becomes diluted in its application within this case. The purpose of creating the economic loss doctrine to begin with was to create a distinct line between warranty and tort law. However, this case pushes that boundary for tort law farther into the area of warranty law by applying tort law where damage is done to a property that was added to a product before it was even given to a user. Second, the court's decision is questionable in light of the Supreme Court's dissenting opinion in Saratoga Fishing Company versus J.N. Martinac and Company. The dissenting justices there were concerned that the majority had adopted an initial user rule, despite the fact that many lower courts had applied an object of the bargain rule. The dissent interpreted the majority's initial user rule as claiming that the product is fixed when sold to an initial user, regardless of whether that user is also in the business of modifying or reselling the product. The object of the bargain rule that the dissent favored, though, rests on the premise that one must look to the product that purchased or bargained for. In the noted case, however, the court claimed it was applying Saratoga Fishing to arrive at its holding, yet in its analysis focused on what the parties contracted for in their agreement. Such analysis appears to be applying an object of the bargain rule rather than the initial user rule that the majority in Saratoga Fishing applied. This ambiguous application of Saratoga Fishing, without much support from other jurisprudence, creates a weak holding by the Ninth Circuit. While these two concerns may lead to future problems, the court's ultimate holding is consistent with the economic loss doctrine. 
As the Ninth Circuit stated, it's unreasonable to expect the owner to depend on a warranty from the shipbuilder that the bearer's ship would not damage any items in the interior outfit. And it should come as a surprise that the shipbuilder did not offer such a warranty. Since the recovery from warranty was not available, a remedy and tort was the only alternative for the owner of the yacht. The court's failure to apply other aspects of the economic loss doctrine to the circumstances leaves open several questions regarding the function of the doctrine in practice. As a result, the line between warranty and tort law will continue to be blurred, and the court's decision to solely look at the party's contracts leaves open opportunity for the parties to continually contract out of application of warranty law. As a consequence, courts, along with practitioners, will be hindered in their application of the economic loss doctrine in the future. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Ben Glass, I'm a 2L, and tonight I'll be discussing the Fifth Circuit's decision in Bravo Express Corporation versus Total Petrochemicals. As crude oil spread across the Bay of Luanda and the Republic of Angola, Bravo Express Corporation found itself in the center of an investigation by Angolan authorities. Bravo, owner of the tanker New Challenge, had time chartered the tanker to CSSA, whose subcharter was operating in the bay when the oil spill occurred. The Angolan government, holding Bravo responsible for the oil spill, detained Bravo's tanker and crew, forcing Bravo to pay $2 million. Roughly seven years later, Bravo, pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1782A, applied for judicial assistance in the Southern District of Texas, requesting evidence from two companies in the Southern District. Bravo sought evidence from these companies for a potential judicial proceeding in the United Kingdom against its time charter, CSSA. Bravo's request was unique for two reasons. First, at the time it filed its application, there was no proceeding pending in the UK. And second, both companies subject to the request were third parties. They were not intended to be named parties in the potential litigation. In the court below, the court denied Bravo's 1782 application. On appeal in the noted case, Bravo contended its application satisfied 1782A's statutory requirements. The U.S. Fifth Circuit held that despite a seven-year delay between the underlying event and the application, Bravo's application satisfied statutory requirements of 1782A because Bravo had provided evidence showing the potential UK proceeding was within reasonable contemplation. By way of background, in 1948, Congress enacted 28 U.S.C. 1782A allowing foreign applicants to seek judicial assistance in any foreign or international tribunal. Importantly, an amendment to the statute 20 years later removed the requirement that a judicial proceeding must be pending before an application is filed. For many years, jurisprudence limited 1782A applications to situations in which a proceeding was imminent, very likely to occur, uh, and very soon to occur. In a significant reversal of this jurisprudence, the Supreme Court in Intel rejected the imminent standard. Noting Congress's elimination of the word pending from 1782A, the court held an application could be granted solely if the potential proceeding was within reasonable contemplation. Since Intel, few courts discussed the limits of within reasonable contemplation. In the noted case, defendants argued a seven-year delay between the underlying act and the application indicated the judicial proceeding was not within reasonable contemplation. In response, the plaintiffs provided an affidavit from their own attorney claiming that they intended to immediately file the proceeding in the United Kingdom after obtaining discovery. In addition, the attorney provided a detailed factual explanation for Bra Bravo's potential claim in the UK. The court, when looking at the seven-year delay uh, looking at all the evidence that was presented, decided that Bravo's efforts to gather evidence to present at the time of filing a procedural requisite under UK law. Furthermore, the court considered evidence showing Bravo had requested extensions of time and the potential opposing party, CSSA, had granted those extensions. So what does this mean for maritime practitioners? First, the bar for demonstrating that a foreign claim is within reasonable contemplation is relatively low. 
A foreign claim can be shown to be within reasonable contemplation by presenting the court with an intent to file a claim. And that can be even something as simple as an affidavit from their own counsel promising that it will be imminently filed. Additionally, a court will look to references to foreign law, excusing any delay between the underlying event and the application. Second, strategic use of 1782A allows practitioners to enjoy the use of both foreign and American discovery laws. Prior to filing a 1782 application, a plaintiff may engage in discovery under the form, foreign forms laws, which may include longer periods of discovery. After filing a 1782 application, however, an applicant may then conduct discovery involving American companies under American law, enjoying American liberal discovery, while simultaneously accepting them from the American requirement that discovery must be conducted after a claim has been filed. Furthermore, an applicant's discovery request is not simply limited to potential parties in a suit, but can also extend to any potential third parties whose evidence might bear relevance to the potential claim. The noted case's reasoning has found support in other courts. For example, in Mies v. Butler, the Second Circuit found that a Dutch applicant satisfied 1782A's statutory requirements, despite having not yet brought a claim in a Dutch court. Similar to the noted case, the court looked to an attorney affidavit and a foreign law. Similarly, in JAS forwarding, the court held that an Ecuadorian applicant's 1782 application satisfied the statutory requirements, despite a delay between the underlying event and the application. The court relied on the plaintiff's cl claim that, similar to the noted case, it must submit its evidence at the time it commences the civil action. So, interestingly, does this same reasoning apply to arbitration? Prior to Intel, the Fifth and Second Circuits consistently held that 1782 does not apply to arbitration. In Intel, however, the court used a definition of tribunal that included arbitral tribunals. Reaction to the Intel decision has been mixed. Many scholars argue that 1782A does not apply to arbitration proceeding. But some scholars, including Hans Smith, the person who wrote 1782A, argues that it does apply to arbitration proceedings. Post-Intel, the Fifth Circuit has been clear and has maintained its stance that 1782A does not apply to arbitration proceedings. In El Paso Court, uh, in, oh, excuse me, in El Paso Court, the court held Intel did not directly address the question of whether 1782A applied to arbitration and refused to overturn prior precedent. In JAS forwarding, the 11th Circuit directly addressed the question of whether 1782A applied to arbitration proceedings. And they held that pending arbitration fell within the purview of 1782A. Subsequently, however, the court vacated its opinion sua sponte and affirmed on other grounds, leaving the question open. To date, circuits have failed to reach a consensus as to whether 1782A applies to private arbitrations. Overall, courts are unlikely to apply Bravo's reasoning to private arbitrations. Parties in private arbitrations contractually agree to procedural rules, and it's unlikely that they would include 1782A clause. As the Fifth Circuit explained, applying 1782A to arbitration proceedings could destroy arbitration's principal advantage as a speedy, economical, and efficient means of dispute resolution. Engaging in American discovery prior to an arbitration proceeding would not only be time consuming, but would eliminate many of the benefits of arbitration, including confidentiality and cost effectiveness. The Nova case substantially broadens foreign discovery opportunities in international maritime litigation. In reaching its decision, the Fifth Circuit relied on both foreign discovery law and an applicant's assurances that it planned to imminently file a claim in the foreign forum. Clearly, these two things indicate that the bar to satisfying 1782A's within reasonable contemplation standard is low. While the practical effects of the court's holding may be surprising to some, to hold otherwise would directly contradict finely crafted public policy. Maritime practitioners involved in international litigation would be wise to take advantage of 1782 and enjoy the benefit of two distinct sets of discovery laws, including expansive American discovery under federal law, thereby enjoying the best of both worlds. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Yang Mai. I am also a second year law student at Tulane. And my case note is regarding the case of In Re American Transport Company on its second appeal to the Eighth Circuit. The MV Julie White was towing four rock laden barges on the Mississippi River when the barges broke loose and drifted downstream towards a dam. All four barges alighted with the dam, ultimately sinking as the current pushed them against the dam gates. After the United States government submitted a written claim to the towboat owner, American Transport Company, or ARCO, ARCO immediately filed an action to limit their liability to the value of the vessel and its pending freight in the amount of $1.3 million. The noted case of In Re American Transport Company heard in the Eighth Circuit was the ensuing litigation. A brief background of the pertinent statutes. First, the Rivers and Harbors Act, which was enacted in 1899 to ensure free and open navigability on America's waterways. Damages to public works that preserve or improve these waterways are covered in Section 408 of the Rivers and Harbors Act. That section provides that it is unlawful to impair in any way works on navigable public works on navigable waterways. For violations of the Rivers and Harbors Act, Section 412 of the Act explicitly gives claimants an in rem claim. Second is the Ship Owners Limitation of Liability Act. Enacted in 1851, primarily to promote American merchant shipping, the Limitation Act enables vessel owners to limit their liability to the value of the vessel in question and its pending freight, absent the privy or knowledge of the vessel owner. Turning to the noted case, the major issue before the Eighth Circuit was whether there was a positive repugnancy between Section 408 of the Rivers and Harbors Act and the Limitation of Liability Act. If such a conflict were found, the Rivers and Harbors of Act, the Rivers and Harbors Act would be the ruling case of the ruling statute as the later passed statute. In order to determine whether any repugnancy occurred, the court looked to the available remedies, the liability standards, and the statute of limitations. As a threshold issue, the court also addressed the suggestion that an interim claim by its very nature falls outside of the coverage of the Limitation Act as it addresses a vessel rather than a vessel owner, and disagreed with that contention, stating that although the Limitation Act speaks in terms of the liability of the owner, in all practical senses, a suit in rem results in the vessel owner's liability via the deprivation of their property. The first and most obvious area of potential conflict would occur if Section 408 were implicitly supplied with an in personam claim which would allow the government to file a claim for full damages and bring it into direct confrontation with the Limitation Act. The circuits are currently split on whether Section 408 is implicitly provided an in person claim. On one set side is the Sixth Circuit that ruled in Hines v. United States that Supreme Court jurisprudence, where an implicit in person remedy was found for other sections of the Rivers and Harbors Act, suggested that such a remedy was likewise available for Section 408 of the Act. The Fifth and Tenth Circuits ruled in opposition to that finding. In the noted case, the Eighth Circuit pointed to both the Fifth Circuit's case of in-ray barnacle management, as well as the Tenth Circuit case of United States Jantran, to come to the conclusion that an in personam remedy was not available for Section 408 of the Rivers and Harbors Act. In further reasoning, the Eighth Circuit noted a series of United States Supreme Court cases that had distanced itself from precedent in which it had been more flexible in finding implied statutory remedies absent congressional directive, explaining that while the purpose of the Rivers and Harbors Act is to provide funds for the replacement and maintenance of improvements on, but made by the United States, it was not up to the court to rewrite the statute to carry out Congress's directives more efficiently when Congress had already given remedies. The Eighth Circuit also determined, for reasons more fully set out in my case note, that neither the standard of liability nor the statute of limitations in either act were, excuse me, were in conflict. Thus it was concluded that because the Limitation Act had not been implicitly repealed 
with respect to Section 408 of the Rivers and Harbors Act, the government's claim was thus subject to limitation of liability and its proceeding. In this case, the Eighth Circuit ruled consistently with two respected maritime circuits. The decision was appropriate given the language and the structure of both the Rivers and Harbors Act and the Limitation Act. Moreover, by allowing a ship owner to limit its liability when a vessel damaged a public work, the holding may promote short-term economic benefits to vessel owners. However, the decision also intensified the rising concern regarding the government's financial ability to maintain safe and functioning dams on America's navigable waterways. There are thousands of dams in the United States that are out of date and potentially dangerous but rehabilitation for America's dams is greatly underfunded. The American Society of Civil Engineers recently gave the State of America's dams a D in their report card for America's infrastructure. The report found that more than 4,000 dams throughout the United States are deficient. The White House noted the need to act by signing the Water Resources Reform and Development Act in June of 2014. The act authorizes $12 billion in funds for waterways projects. However, repairs on only high hazard dams, which are dams whose breach are likely to result in the loss of human life and constitute about half of those dams in need of repair, has been estimated at 21 million. In addition to the humanitarian and environmental implications of a breach, the commercial risk of an impassable river is extreme. Traffic stoppage on the Mississippi the same river cited in the noted case would affect more than 8,000 jobs and 54 million in wages and benefits. When a 200 mile stretch of the Mississippi between St. Louis, Missouri and Cairo, Illinois became impassable in the winter of 2013, more than $7 billion worth of goods were at risk in December and January alone. These numbers make it evident that while it is not a ship owner's responsibility, to ensure the continued functioning of dams, exacerbating problems on these public works that are essential to the continuation of their trade is not in a vessel owner's best interest either. Thousands, in conclusion, thousands of dams across America are in need of vital repairs, and the government agencies responsible for their upkeep are drastically underfunded. The decision in the noted case allows for a vessel owner to limit its liability to the value of the vessel and its pending freight when a vessel damages a dam. This leaves the taxpayers responsible for the remaining cost of repairing the dam, irrespective of the amount. The Limitation Act does provide vessel owners with important economic and tactical advantages when an accident occurs and litigation follows. However, with, its, with respect to its interaction with Section 408 of the Rivers and Harbors Act, its immediate advantages to vessel owners are outweighed by the long-term detrimental effects to maritime commerce and the danger to downstream communities. Thus, while the Eighth Circuit promulgated a legally sound decision in INRE American Transport Company, public policy and the future of maritime commerce requires that the legislature act and provide the government with an explicit in-person remedy when a violation of Section 408 occurs. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is James Pound. I'm a 2L, and tonight I'll be speaking about a decision handed down by uh, the, United, the District Court of uh, New Jersey with respect to uh, antitrust immunity for, for ocean shipping companies. Um, so in February 2012, federal officials raided various ocean shipping companies' offices and related to criminal antitrust investigations. After these raids were publicly disclosed, some officers of these shipping companies pled guilty to criminal charges. Following that revelation, several customers of these shipping companies filed class actions in various states across the country, alleging that these companies operated under unfiled agreements to reduce capacity in violation of the Sherman Act. The plaintiffs consisted of direct purchasers, manufacturers such as Honda, Nissan, and Volkswagen, and also indirect purchasers such as car dealers, end payers, and automobile dealers. The various plaintiffs sought relief under the Clayton Act, but they also sought relief under various states' antitrust laws. In October 2013, the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey 
was selected as the transferee court for the multi-district litigation, over 31 related cases. In January 2015, the defendants filed consolidated motions to dismiss. So before turning to the court's decision, I want to briefly address the relevant historical background. Beginning with the Sherman Act of 1890, antitrust regulations swept across the country. In 1914, the Clayton Act expanded the antitrust regime by providing civil remedies for violations of the Sherman Act. Congress passed the Shipping Act of 1916 to protect maritime commerce from the wave of antitrust regulation. The Act granted limited immunity to ocean shipping companies by permitting the open organization of shipping conferences. It also established the United States Shipping Board, the predecessor of, uh, to the FMC, to regulate the industry. But over time, courts increasingly narrowed the scope of this antitrust immunity, and in doing so, they created parallel jurisdictions between district courts and the FMC. This caused ocean shipping companies to be unsure as to which of their activities were covered by the antitrust immunities and which were not. So the Shipping Act of 1984 originated out of this regulatory uncertainty that many feared might disadvantage ocean shipping companies against international competition. In the Act, Congress expressly indicated that it was designed to create a fair regulatory process with minimum government intervention and regulatory costs. It also indicated that its purpose was to promote U.S. exports through competitive and efficient ocean transportation. The Act's subsequent provisions outlined the various activity that is exempted from antitrust laws and instead under the purview of the FMC. But because the Act lacked explicit reference to state antitrust immunity, uncertainty remained as to whether the Act implicitly preempted private claims under state antitrust laws. In the years following the passage of the Act, lower courts examined the Act's preemptive effect on various state laws applicable to the maritime industry. But until the noted case, federal courts had never expressly ruled on whether the Act's brand of antitrust immunity extended to claims under state laws. Now, to the district court's decision. To review, the court was presented with the two sets of claims, the federal claims and the state claims. The federal claims sought relief under the Clayton Act and the state claims under the various states' laws. With respect to the federal claims, there is no explicit reference to capacity restriction agreements in the 1984 Act. Therefore, the court had to determine whether the capacity restriction agreements were one of the types of agreements that Congress intended to be shielded from antitrust laws and instead within the purview of the FMC. The court ultimately held the affirmative. It found that the broad scope of the general prohibition section in the Act included the collusive capacity restrictions that were alleged in the complaint. Because the capacity restrictions agreements were not filed with the FMC and the Act provides antitrust immunity for activity prohibited therein, the plaintiff's request for relief for the unfiled capacity restriction agreements was therefore barred. Now, moving on to the claims brought under the various state antitrust laws. As a reminder, there is no express mention of state antitrust immunity in the Shipping Act. The, VAC, the Act vaguely refers to antitrust immunity, so the court had occasion to decide whether the, that included antitrust immunity only from federal laws or also from state laws. So with respect to the state claims, the defendants argued that allowing for antitrust claims under the various state laws would cut against the Act's purpose of minimizing government intervention and regulatory costs, and thus it should be preempted under federal law, or preempted by federal law, rather. The plaintiffs, on the other hand, argue that the state antitrust laws do not conflict with that purpose, but rather they complement the Act's fourth purpose of promoting competitive ocean transportation. So the court agreed with the plaintiff's, with the plaintiff's reasoning in part, but it ultimately refused to disregard the effect of allowing the state claims on the Act's first stated purpose. The court held that the Act was intended to establish an exclusive system of redress through the FMC for shipping violations. It also refused to find the Act's silence on state antitrust immunity dispositive Instead, it looked at the legislative history, which indicated the FMC was to be given exclusive jurisdiction in administering all provisions of the Shipping Act. Accordingly, it became the first case in which a court expressly held state antitrust claims were conflict preempted by the Shipping Act. So with respect to the court's decision, a plain reading of the Act and legislative history both support the inclusion of capacity reduction agreements. Subpart 5 in particular of the Act is particularly extensive as it encompasses any broad, any cooperative working arrangement among ocean carriers. Agreements to limit the number of vessels in operation plainly fall within such an arrangement. If unfiled agreements to reduce capacity were not included in the Shipping Act, they would be subjected to private antitrust actions in federal court, while remedies for other similar agreements would be under the sole discretion of the FMC. In addition, the FMC enforces the same monitoring report requirements and, and narrative statement requirements for both capacity restriction agreements and rate agreements. 
So comparable activities under the same FMC regulations would be subject to separate jurisdictions and varying remedies when faced with antitrust scrutiny. Second, the court's refusal to subject the industry to a patchwork of state laws aligned with Congress's initial concern in its passage of the act, which was the existence of parallel jurisdictions between the FMC and federal courts. <coughs> the legislative history is clear, and it's discussed in depth in the note, suggesting that Congress sought to designate the FMC as the sole avenue of antitrust redress through the 1984 Act. It empowered the FMC similar to a district court. The FMC can order reparations up to double actual damages. It can subpoena witnesses and evidence. It can provide a range of sanctions for, for prohibited conduct, and its decisions are also appealable to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. It would be somewhat counterintuitive for Congress to allow the FMC to heavily sanction and regulate antitrust violations if the violator still faced the threat of private actions under the antitrust laws of 50 states. Moreover, it would be counterproductive for Congress in seeking to minimize government intervention and regulatory costs to empower the FMC with expansive regulatory tools similar to those of district courts in order for the agency to regulate conduct that's still sanctionable in the same manner by its counterpart. This would seem to reestablish parallel jurisdictions and return the industry to a pre-1984 atmosphere of regulatory uncertainty. For this reason, I think the court correctly deferred to the congressional mandate implied in the act to simplify the regulatory scheme by granting the FMC exclusive authority to sanction antitrust violations. And finally, rapid technological advances, the increasing globalization of services, and the absence of uniform international regulation have created further demand for regulatory clarity in the industry. For this reason, the court appropriately dismissed the defendant's argument that their desired outcome promotes competitive and efficient ocean transportation by deterring antitrust violations through the threat of, of state claims. Under that analysis, the court would have been forced to weigh competing policy arguments because evidence also exists that legal and regulatory clarity resulting from complete antitrust immunity for the industry promotes competition and efficiency by reducing costs and fostering innovation. The court, however, laudably refused to substitute congressional intent with its own policy preference. Instead, it, re it reaffirmed FMC autonomy over shipping conferences, and it restored the clarity and legal certainty envisioned by Congress in its passage of the act. Thank you. Hello, my name is Zach Wood. I am a SUA at Tulane Law. In Comar Marine, the Raider Marine Logistics, the Fifth Circuit created a strict standard for contracts giving rise to a maritime lien. In that case, Chris Sandland and Tracy Lorette purchased four vessels from Comar Marine, uh, entering into management agreements for each vessel. These management agreements appointed Comar to market, manage, and operate the vessels. And in exchange, the ship owners would give Comar a monthly management fee and reimburse it for all expenses. After a fluctuation in the charter market, the defendant owners breached the management agreements and executed agreements with other companies. Comar sought and secured arrest for each of the vessels, claiming unpaid necessities, and termination of fees under the agreement gave rise to a maritime lien. The defendant owners claimed the vessels were wrongfully arrested. The trial court awarded Comar damages and found Comar wrongfully arrested the vessels because the breach of the management agreements did not give rise to maritime liens. Therefore, the, creditor, the vessel's creditor's preferred ship mortgages had a priority over the uh, claim of breach of contract. In the noted case, the Fifth Circuit held that because a management agreement was not practically identical to a bare boat charter or any other charter agreement which has historically given rise to a maritime lien, the liens were unlawful. First, the court acknowledged that only certain agreements give rise to maritime liens, and a management agreement has not generally been recognized as such. A maritime lien is a unique aspect of maritime law, which allows a security interest in a vessel without impeding its voyage. This is a, an exception to the rule that creditors have equal rights to the property in recovery of debts. The concept arose from the unique transient nature of vessels which require ships to be constantly in motion in order to generate capital. Maritime lien protect, protects the vessel from unnecessary delay and gives the creditor security from the vessel sailing away from its obligations. Maritime liens are secret liens and do not require recordation and may therefore disadvantage general creditors. For this reason, courts have held that maritime liens are strict time jurists 
cannot be extended by construction, analogy, or inference. Some courts have stated only maritime, only liens recognized today are the ones created by statute or those historically recognized in maritime law. According to Fifth Circuit jurisprudence, to determine the validity of a maritime lien, courts must normally refer to statutory law or those liens that have historically been recognized. The court then noted that the management agreements of uh, Mecklenburg are not historically recognized as such a type. The court then went on to distinguish the management agreements from a traditional bareboat charter. Comar claimed that the management agreements uh, should give rise to maritime lien because they were functionally equivalent to bareboat charters, also known as demise charters. The court defined a bareboat charter as one in which the vessel is transferred without crew, provisions, fuel, or supplies, i.e., bareboat. A bareboat charter must supply essential operating expenses when he or she is operating the vessel. Other courts have defined a demise charter as taking full possession, command, and navigation of the vessel. Furthermore, no technical words are necessary to create a demise. Rather, it is enough that the language used shows an intent to transfer the vessel, transfer possession, command, and control. The court distinguished Comar's contract and the railroad agreement in that Comar would not pay the vessel with operating expenses, did not make periodic payments to the owners, rather the owners paid Comar management fee, and Comar was marketing voyages for its own for the owners rather than on its own behalf. Thus the court concluded that Comar's management agreement was not functionally equivalent to a traditional bare boat charter. However, the court went further to find that even if the agreements were functionally equivalent, the only contracts would get, which give rise to maritime liens are those which are practically identical to those which have traditionally given rise as such. The court cites only one case from the Ninth Circuit, management, uh, logistics management, and its own decision in cargo shipping. However, neither of those cases uses the court's identically, uh, practically identical language, nor does the court provide any reasoning behind the strict standard. The court went on to find that Comar's reliance on Action Marine was misplaced for two reasons. First, because uh, Action Marine stood for the uncontroversial proposition that breach of a charter gives rise to a maritime lien. Second, uh, the court distinguished Action Marine because that contract dealt with a towing contract rather than a management contract. The court's holding that a management agreement is not sufficiently similar to a bare road agreement uh, to give rise to a maritime lien is likely correct. However, the further holding that a contract must be practically identical to uh, a charter historically giving rise to a maritime agreement is not sound, necessary, nor in furtherance of the public policy reasoning which is given in existence to maritime liens. The court acknowledged that only certain The court's decision was unnecessary because it could have ended its decision with, uh, without creating the practical identical standard. It is unsound because it ignored its supporting jurisprudence. Uh, it, it had an absence of supporting jurisprudence for this new standard. Uh, it made little attempt to distinguish cases provided by Comar for the proposition that courts can reasonably expand the universe of contracts giving rise to maritime needs. Furthermore, it ignored a footnote in its own side of case in logistics management, which gave a large amount of jurisprudence for the holding that uh, federal courts have full authority to update old doctrines and recognize new forms of liens if warranted by new conditions. In distinguishing action marine, the court only cited, only stated that our decision dealt with a towing contract rather than a management agreement without explanation. Finally, the court's new rule that contracts must be practically identical to those historically giving rise to liens is uh, incorrect for three reasons. First, it goes against decades of jurisprudence expanding the universe of uh, contracts giving rise to maritime liens. For example, in logistics management, the one apparent tent arena, the Ninth Circuit held that a maritime lien could arise from a contract with an NBOC state. The court recognized that a maritime lien between an NVOCC and a charter did not appreciably expand the universe giving rise to maritime liens. 
The course based its conclusion on the fact that courts have always granted liens for owners and operators of a vessel and later began granting liens between people who operated the vessel but did not own it. The court reasoned this expansion was due to a recognition that it is the carrier's assumption of responsibility which creates a lien. Other courts have expanded the universe of contracts giving rise to maritime liens to include subcharters, tow contracts, uh, advances made by a ship's agent, and unpaid insurance premiums. The court also does not address how this practical identical standard addresses those contracts which have recently been allowed to give rise to a lien. Are contracts for insurance, agency contracts, towing contracts, tugboats, NDOCCs, and subcharters now overruled? This is not discussed. Furthermore, there is no explanation for how courts are to determine which, which contracts are practically identical rather than uh, functionally identical or basically identical. Uh, second, the court fails to recognize a degree of flexibility within categories that are strict tie jurors. It fails to acknowledge that the strict tie juror standard which determines which contracts give rise to maritime liens can nonetheless allow for variations inside those respective types. It is only the category of contract which cannot be expanded, not what makes up each category. It is undeniable that a breach of a charter party gives rise uh, is strict jurors, but what constitutes a, constitutes a charter party is not governed by the strict tie jurors standard. Courts usually allow demise when a charter takes possession, command, and navigation of the ship. Part Homar's management agreement, which gave it the power to market, manage, and operate the vessels, is arguably similar. Finally, it goes against the public policy which created maritime liens in the first place. Maritime liens are strict on jurors because they operate to disadvantage general creditors. However, they also allow a creditor security to lend to a vessel without fear of the vessel sailing away from its obligations. The vessel owners in Comar were attempting to do just that. The substantive distinction between a bare boat charter and the homeowner's management agreement, i.e. paying for fuel, insurance, and motor payment, has little to do with the practical effect of the circumstances. Comar and the vessel owners had an agreement, the vessel owners breached the agreement and were attempting to sail away, and Comar attempted to stop them. Shielding the breaching vessel owners from this uh, relationship under the standard of practically identical only serves to complicate what it would otherwise be a simple relationship. In conclusion, by limiting contracts giving rise to maritime liens to those which are practically identical, uh, the Fifth Circuit has attempted to halt a growing legal doctrine which was created to address a concern naturally arising in the shipping industry. Lack of reasoning, explanation, or supporting jurisprudence leaves the maritime lien doctrine in a precarious state of uncertainty. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ben Woody. I'm an attorney with Fox Libra International, and I'm an Admiralty LLM candidate here at Tulane University School of Law. And um, this is a paper that I'm going to be presenting also at the International Graduate Legal Research Conference at King's College, London. Uh, that'll be in two weeks, and looking forward to it. I'd like to thank especially Alana Rickstein and Justin Guthrie for their help in getting this prepared. So, my case is entitled St. Paul Fire and Marine Insurance versus Abe and Svoboda. And it's a, it's a marine insurance contract case that comes out of the Eighth Circuit. In this case, Abe and Svoboda was hired uh, to make certain repairs on the Pell Bridge. Uh, they, and what they needed was two barges. So they leased them. They got two barges, and they needed to uh, get insurance, and they needed to have them serve as the lease said. So, as soon as they leased these barges, they put them on their schedule of vessels with Continental Insurance Group and subsequently had a survey performed on them. A few months later, the survey comes back and indicates that the barges are in pretty bad shape. Uh, they're not uh, structurally sound and they're valued at significantly lower than uh, the agreed upon price in the lease. Um, after the survey comes out, St. Paul Fire and Marine Insurance uh, 
comes to Ave uh, and says, we want to insure your vessels. So they come, they make an agreement that uh, Ave and Svoboda will uh, insure all of their vessels with St. Paul. And St. Paul simply requires that Continental deliver the application, or, sorry, St. Paul asks that Ave deliver the application that they submitted to Continental. This application did not include that survey, which had that much lower value. And it did not include the fact that the barges are not structurally sound. In any good marine insurance case, the barges sink. <laughs> so, of course, they sink to the bottom of the Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. And when Ave and Svoboda make a claim against, or make a claim to St. Paul to cover wreck removal expenses, St. Paul finds out that there was a survey done and they deny coverage, citing a breach of the doctrine of Uber Meg Fidei. Uh, St. Paul fires, files a declaratory judgment action in the district court in Minnesota, uh, to that effect, seeking a denial of uh, the duty to the uh, duty to cover. And um, they win. They have summary judgment granted in their favor. And Ave and Zuboda appeals to the Eighth Circuit. The Eighth Circuit over reverses the district court opinion. They say St. Paul failed to establish that they actually rely on the non-disclosure of that survey. <clears throat> now, I keep using the words Uberme Fide, and I personally don't speak Latin, so I don't know what they mean, but <laughs> I've read that they mean duty of utmost good faith. Not duty of good faith duty of utmost faith. Uh, this doctrine comes from the 17th century and 18th century when uh, marine underwriters were faced with the, uh, with the business of underwriting risks and vessels that they probably never see or have any reason to inspect themselves. So all of the information that the underwriters could use to assess the risk, whether to accept it, and if so, what premium to fix. All of the information had to come directly from the insurer. Now, that's a very, very, very tall order. Because the doctrine says any material misrepresentation or non-disclosure made by the insurer gives the marine underwriter the authority to, to void the contract. That's it. I mean, it's not a, not a hard concept. It's not, there's not much to it. Partly, this is why I chose this topic. This is a, uh, this is a very harsh, very anachronistic doctrine. And you know, it seems to have survived more on the strength of inertia than of sound legal reasoning. <clears throat> The doctrine of the of the day is firmly entrenched. That's legally significant, obviously, because of the Wilburn Boat decision, which said, where there's a conflict between state and federal law, if the federal law uh, is firmly entrenched, or well entrenched, deeply entrenched, whatever, uh, then federal law applies, and state law doesn't. Uh, almost all circuits that have ruled on this issue have found it to be deeply entrenched. Believe it or not, the Fifth Circuit is the only one that hasn't. And uh, there are about six cases out there that poke fun at the Fifth Circuit for not holding. So what does this actually mean? What risks, what non-disclosures, what makes this doctrine true? Well, if you misrepresent the value of the insured, the insurable interest, that gives them that gives the underwriter all the reason in the world to avoid the contract. If you misrepresent the nature of the vessel and how it's being used, avoid the contract. If you misrepresent the criminal history of the people who will be driving the boat, and the boat crashes uh, as a result of a hurricane destroying it, avoid the policy. It's very harsh. It's very, very harsh. Now, 
as we've gone over this, I told you all that the Eighth Circuit said that you need to establish actual reliance, that a marine insurance underwriter needs to show actual reliance. Well, they get that language from one case, and that is the Puritan Insurance Company versus the, steam, the Eagle Steamship Company. That's the second circuit case from 1986, in which those words, some derivation thereof, appear. And that is the only case, the only case in centuries of Supreme of, of appellate court precedent that used those words in New Bear May for any cases. So why are they suddenly requiring, why is the Eighth Circuit requiring actual reliance? Well, the Eighth Circuit takes a look at their own precedent. There's a case called Shipley versus Arkansas Blue Cross and Blue Shield in which uh, someone who had a heart attack and died uh, could not uh, have his medical expenses covered from an ERISA-governed uh, health insurance policy. The Eighth Circuit said you need to establish actual reliance on those misrepresentations or non-disclosures. So that's the risk. Second, the court relied on country, uh, countryside versus or, in which an automobile policy was at dispute, was in dispute, and the, uh, Mr. Orr had a whole bunch of traffic infractions that he didn't tell his carrier about. And the Eighth Circuit said, you, uh, you need to establish that the, or the car insurance company needs to prove that you actually relied on that uh, non-disclosure. So where is this going? Why is, why is the Eighth Circuit relying on other forms of insurance on a marine insurance case? Well. Let's, let's cut to the chase. Right now, um, the British Parliament has passed the Insurance Act of 2015, which comes into effect uh, in August of 2016. This act explicitly uh, disavows the uh, duty of utmost good faith and replaces it with the duty of fair presentment, which I have to agree with. I think that's sound policy. This is. 2016, underwriters can figure stuff out on their own. In addition, I know that that minor circuit split between the fifth and all the other circuits. Um, this case is pending before uh, the Supreme Court on a petition for writ of certiorari. It's my hope that the Supreme Court will grant the writ. So it can do one of two things. Either tell us how this duty of Barame Fidei actually works, or it can deny the petition for cert, and it can let this old anachronistic doctrine remain at the bottom of the sea. Thank you. All right, I want to thank you all for coming. We had a great crowd today. Um, on behalf of the Admiralty and Maritime Law Committee of the ABA TIP section and Lisco and Lewis, um, you know, welcome. Thanks for being here, and uh, we'd like to. Have a drink with you afterwards. Mm -hmm.